Please welcome Dennis A. Mitchell, Executive Vice President for University Life, Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, and Professor of Dental Medicine at CUMC. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is such a pleasure to see you uh, here this morning and um, to open this incredible opportunity for dialogue for our university. I'm Dennis Mitchell. I am the vice, executive vice president for university life as well as senior vice provost for faculty advancement. Um, and I go by he, him, and his pronouns. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the, um, I want to welcome today's discussion on awakening our democracy, affirmative action, the Supreme Court, and the road ahead for higher education. I also would like to thank our co-sponsors for this partnership in planning today's event. The Office of the President, thank you. Uh, and Columbia Law School, thank you. Our Awakening Our Democracy series seeks to delve into timely topics. Our mission, ultimately and generally speaking, is to convene experts who can help us unpack contemporary issues that are dominating the headlines, issues that are disrupting or have the potential to disrupt our society. Today's topic, affirmative action and its uncertain future, definitely checks all of those boxes. Two legal actions, students for fair admissions versus Harvard, and students for fair admissions versus the University of North Carolina were brought before the Supreme Court last fall. Both cases challenged the constitutionality of affirmative action in the college admissions process. The court, which is expected to issue its ruling in late spring or early summer, will either affirm and protect race-conscious admissions policies in effect for the last few decades, or potentially dismantle the project altogether and compel universities to adopt a race-blind admissions process moving forward. It is not an exaggeration to say that these two cases have the potential to shape the contours of American life for decades to come, <clears throat> not just in higher education, but across our society. To help us think about this critical issue, we are fortunate to have a wonderful group of scholars for today's event, which will be moderated uh, which will be a moderated discussion followed by a question and answer period. I'd like to introduce our panelists and moderator now. But please note, um, we only have time to share some of their incredible accomplishments. So as always, please, 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 I encourage you to learn more about each of them online. Our moderator today will be Jess Braven who covers the U.S. Supreme Court for the Wall Street Journal. Jess has also served as a United Nations correspondent and editor of the Wall Street Journal California Weekly. He is the author of several books and serves as a Regent Emeritus of the University of California. He has also served on the Berkeley, California Police Review Commission and taught at UC Washington Center. He is a graduate of Harvard College and holds a law degree from UC Berkeley. Thank you, Jess, and welcome to Columbia. Professor Olatunde Johnson is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Class of 59 Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, where she teaches and writes about a range of public law matters, <clears throat> including anti-discrimination law, racial justice, courts, and the state of democracy in the United States. Professor Johnson is a frequent commentator on issues involving civil rights and inequality, the Supreme Court, Congress, and judicial nominations. In 2021, President Biden appointed Professor Johnson to the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court. Thank you, Professor Johnson. Visiting from NYU's School of Education, Professor Mike Hoawin joins us. His research and teaching critically examines the benefits and consequences of the racialized public policy instruments in educational systems. 
Dr. Wynn has also extensive professional experience in the federal government, having served as a senior staff member in the United States Congress. Most recently, he co-authored two amicus briefs on the behalf of the social scientists in SFFA versus Harvard, which were discussed during oral arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court and cited by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit in their opinion to uphold affirmative action. Thank you, Professor Wen, and welcome to Columbia. Professor Ted Shaw. Ted Shaw began his legal career as a Charles Evan Hughes Fellow of Columbia University Law School. He worked in the U.S. Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division before joining the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where he stayed for 26 years. Professor Shaw established the Western Regional Legal Defense Fund in Los Angeles and was appointed the Director Counsel in 2004. He has taught at the University of Michigan, Columbia University, the City University of New York, and Temple University. He is currently the director of the Julius L. Chambers Distinguished Professor of Law and director of the UNC Center for Civil Rights at University of North Carolina School of Law. Thank you, Professor, and welcome back to Columbia. In addition to our esteemed panelists, I'm honored to have with us this afternoon someone who has been on the front lines in this fight from the beginning, our very own Lee Bollinger, president of Columbia University. Lee has graciously agreed to provide some broader context for today's discussion, and we really could not have asked for a better setup to the conversation. Many of you are probably aware that Lee Bollinger has distinguished himself as the nation's leading First Amendment scholar. He has authored, co-authored, and edited numerous books on the topic and lectures and teaches on the subject as well. He is equally well known for his robust advocacy for affirmative action in higher education. For more than two decades, he has spoken and written frequently about the value of racial, cultural, and socioeconomic diversity to American society in general and higher ed in particular. His commitment to protecting and defending diversity in higher education is so passionate and unyielding that he actually has been named a defendant in not one, but two cases that ascended to the Supreme Court, Grutter versus Bollinger and Gratz versus Bollinger. The cases were brought when he was president of the University of Michigan in the 1990s and decided in 2003. Grutter became a landmark case as the Supreme Court for the first time upheld the constitutional right of colleges and universities to engage in affirmative action to advance diversity in higher education. You know you're making an impact on a topic when you are summoned to the Supreme Court to explain and defend your position. And it's worth noting that Lee relishes this opportunity. Other university presidents might have settled the case quietly. Lee Bollinger, on the other hand, embraced the controversy because he knew that this was a conversation this nation must engage in. And now Lee is making headlines again with the release of a new and equally robust defense of affirmative action. With his longtime writing collaborator, Jeffrey Stone, an eminent constitutional scholar, the two have just released a new book, A Legacy of Discrimination, The Essential Constitutionality of Affirmative Action. The book makes not only the legal case for the protection of affirmative action, but makes the moral case as well. Lawrence Tribe, professor of constitutional law emeritus at Harvard Law School, had this to say about the book in his review. In this brilliant history and reassessment of our still unfinished journey of race, two of America's most perceptive students of the history and its legal dimensions, President Lee Bollinger of Columbia University and Professor Jeffrey Stone, formerly Dean of Chicago Law School, put the long simmering affirmative action debate in its urgent current context and reframe that debate in terms more faithful to what is truly at stake. I'm anxious to hear what President Bollinger has to say, and I know you are too. So please join me in welcoming President Lee Bollinger. 
Thank you uh, very, very much, Dennis. And, uh, you know, gives me the opportunity to say that Columbia is a different place and a better place by far uh, because of the work that Dennis has done in the provost's office and now as EVP for uh, University Life. I mean, he's been a spectacular colleague, a uh, spectacular uh, leader of Columbia. So what I thought I could do in just uh, 10 minutes is to give you a framework for the discussion that will follow. All of these individuals here, I know them. The, I mean, Ted is a deep and long friend and colleague. Alda is a colleague. Uh, these are really uh, people that you can um, learn from and trust. So I'm going to give you the framework uh, for this. So it takes about seven or eight nine steps, let's say. And it all starts with Brown versus Board of Education. So 1954, as we all know in America, the Supreme Court declared that official intentional segregation, discrimination against children uh, in public education was unconstitutional, overruling an 1898 decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, that had allowed separate but equal. So. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, is it critically important uh, for what it held about public education. But it was much more important than that because it was part of a civil rights movement in the United States. It was part of an effort to come to terms with race, with injustices, with slavery, with Jim Crow, with ongoing discrimination. The 1950s and 60s and into the 70s were some of the most informative, most informative years in the history of the country. As Dennis says, I teach the First Amendment. I write about the First Amendment. I'm an expert on it. One of the themes about the First Amendment is that it was shaped and defined by the civil rights cases of the 1960s. But I could go to the Fourth Amendment and due process. I could go to the 14th Amendment and discrimination based on gender. I could go to Roe versus Wade in 1973. The civil rights movement following upon or part of Brown was really a transformative moment for American history. Sadly, it did not end the issues that it had raised. But it was a powerful, powerful period of time because of the efforts to, uh, to come to terms with the moral, policy, and constitutional dimensions of racial injustice in America. Then we go to the 1970s. <clears throat> and in about the mid-1970s, universities, colleges, all across the United States, really, collectively, decided, I mean, they decided individually, but collectively, unanimously, they all decided that it was no longer acceptable to have student bodies that were virtually all white male. And that began a very, very deliberate and intentional effort to introduce affirmative action, to introduce uh, diversity as a, as a student body goal, and it, w it was profound. Then you go to 1978 and the case of Bakke, University of California uh, versus Bakke. And that decision by American universities, public universities, I won't go into the Constitution and state action doctrine, and so on, but basically the practice of taking race into account, ethnicity, taking that, those factors into account was challenged as a violation of the 14th Amendment, racial discrimination. And the Bakke case was formative. There had been a transition in the Warren Court. There was now a significant conservative group of justices. There were still the liberal wing of the court and Justice Powell was in the middle. Four justices said, led by Justice Thurgood Marshall, it absolutely should be constitutional for state universities and private universities to take into account race as a way to redress racial injustices. And four said, 
We should never allow race to be considered for good, certainly not for bad, purposes by state institutions. And Powell said, here's the way it will go. And everybody followed this opinion. If you take race into account for purposes of building a racially diverse student body, and you do it as a means of correcting for racial injustice in the society, that is unconstitutional. If you take race into account not to correct for racial injustices in the society, but because you have a theory about education and you think bringing people together from different races and geographies and backgrounds is good, that's OK. And that became the rationale for affirmative action in universities all across the United States. And every single university president, every single provost, every single dean was instructed by their general counsel, when you talk about affirmative action, do not say it is linked to trying to correct for racial injustices in the society. You can only justify it as a means of bringing people together for general educational benefits. Because if you do the former, we'll be sued. And under Powell's opinion, which is the leading doctrine now, it'll be overturned. Now we go to the late 80s. I'm now dean of the law school at the University of Michigan. Ted is a friend and colleague. The Justice Department, the Education Department, and the Reagan administration are beginning to investigate universities about their practices in admissions, trying to begin a basis for stopping affirmative action. We revise our policy at the University of Michigan Law School. We go into the 90s. A group brings a lawsuit against the University of Texas Law School claiming that taking race into account, especially the way they did, was unconstitutional. It's called the Hopwood case. It went to the Fifth Circuit, and the, and the Fifth Circuit held that it was unconstitutional for the University of Texas to take race into account. It was a shocking decision. Then Proposition 209 happens in California. Banning as a matter of constitutional law in California, taking race into account. It passes. It's a shock to the nation. I become president of the University of Michigan in 1997, January, and I'm told immediately, expect to be sued uh, for violating the 14th Amendment Constitution for Michigan's policies of taking race into account to build a diverse student body, and we were. And those two cases, Gruder and Gratz, became the dominant part of my life for the next uh, five to six years. So it was a moment in time when the kind of anti-affirmative action forces were sweeping the country. Proposition 209 still governs public institutions, universities in California. The effects of that are obvious. Been a decline 50% more in the number of African Americans attending Berkeley, UCLA, and so on. And they've worked very hard over the decades to try to change this. 2003, the landmark decision of Grutter is handed down. And for the first time, a majority of the Supreme Court, in an opinion written, uh, by Sandra O'Connor upholds the constitutionality of universities, colleges, taking race into account for purposes of building a diverse student body for a diverse educational, for the benefits of that. Strong decision. First time there's a majority of the court. Terrific outcome. It neglects the racial injustice theory, does not allow that to, to flourish and oddly says, we hope this will not be needed in 25 years. The only time I know of a Supreme Court decision that says this may be good for just 25 years. After the Hopwood decision 
in the Fifth Circuit in the 1990s when the University of Texas was told it couldn't take race into account, that it was unconstitutional, the University of Texas still wanted to have a diverse student body. So they came up with an idea called the 10% solution in which they said, we will take the top 10% of all students of each high school in the state. And because those high schools were segregated, not officially, but de facto, they were able to get a diverse student body. Once Gratz Gruder was decided, they realized that maybe they'd add a consideration of race ethnicity on top of the 10% solution and then build an even more diverse student body. And they did. University of Texas and those policies were then challenged as unconstitutional. And there were two cases called Fisher 1, Fisher 2 in 2013, I think, and um, anyway, right around that period of time, in which the Supreme Court said, we're still bound by and we still respect Grutter. And they made it just a little more difficult doctrinally to justify affirmative action, but I won't go into it. So you have Grutter, you have the two Fisher cases, and now you come to the present. Harvard, we all know, is facing uh, a suit that claims not only that affirmative action is unconstitutional, or not, Ill it's illegal and on constitutional, but that Harvard discriminated against Asian Americans. University of North Carolina has also been uh, uh, litigated against on the grounds that what they do violates the Constitution. Those two cases are before the court. It is unclear what the court will do, of course. We won't know in probably until June. But if you look at last summer and the Dobbs case, that was a decision to flatly overrule Roe versus Wade from 1973. A shocking reversal of longstanding doctrine in the Supreme Court. If you go back to a couple of cases in the 2006-8 period, public school systems in Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington wanted to try to get more diverse K through 12 student populations. And they devised systems where they would take kids from different parts of the cities and they would move them to different uh, schools to get a racially diverse and otherwise diverse student body. The cases went to the Supreme Court and the majority of the Supreme Court held it was unconstitutional for these K through 12 public education systems to take race into account. And Justice Roberts said, if you want to stop discrimination on the basis of race, then you need to stop discriminating on the basis of race. A declaration that any consideration of race for any public policy purpose, including integration or certainly trying to achieve racial justice, will not be allowed. If you look at the composition of the court today, Justice Thomas and things he said, Justice Alito, uh, uh, Roberts and what he said. It does not look good for the outcome with respect to the Grutter case. I think there are two possible outcomes. Like Roe, da Grutter is overruled. A disaster, for, a tragedy for America, a tragedy for American higher education. The other option, I think, is that the doctrines around this become so severe, they're called the strict scrutiny doctrine, that it really becomes practically impossible for universities to continue practicing, dealing with race in America through affirmative action. Jeff Stone and I have written a book, as, uh, as Dennis said, the thrust of the book is to recount everything I just said and to say it was a real mistake that Powell made in 1978 in taking away from the discussion the, the argument that we are still living with the effects of past discrimination and we are still living with ongoing discrimination. The statistics are shocking. 
the number of black children who attend all black schools has tripled in the last two or three decades. Our, seg our public education system in city after city is as segregated as, it was, as they were in 1960. There are similar things to say about housing, employment, et cetera. We know with police um, uh, conduct and the criminal justice system, this is not something that has been dealt with or addressed by any means. What colleges and universities have done is noble. It's also practical and right. And it's had very, very positive effects on the society. So our view is it would, it would be a, a, a deep, shameful moment for the society uh, to give up on uh, that mission, which started with Brown versus Board of Education. Thank you very much. Now the panelists. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm Jess Braven, uh, Supreme Court reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Thanks for coming, and uh, thanks to President Bollinger for giving us the defendant's perspective uh, on the affirmative action cases. It's uh, great to have an actual litigant from landmark cases to explain uh, what he uh, saw and why he got to that place, and it was a, a wonderfully succinct explanation of where we are in the law now, and of course, here's the book, so well, we like, always like to have a plug. And it's always great to come to Justice Gorsuch's alma mater here at Columbia University. He, of course, like most of uh, us in the room, was admitted uh, to a selective college through an admission system that applied affirmative action. He got in uh, in the 1980s and probably many of us did that as well. So the people who, who are here today are all can judge the effects on their education from having uh, race conscious admission systems. So just something to, to think about there. Um, I wanted to start off, I, I, uh, we're supposed to be a little uh, provocative in university, so I want to start out with a uh, perhaps a provocative question. President Bollinger said quite clearly, and his book is very candid, that affirmative action began as a way to make up for past discrimination and continuing discrimination in American society, and that when the Bakke case came, administrators essentially had to shoehorn their objectives into a diversity rationale and make it fit through that lens for the years going forward. And throughout higher education, uh, support for affirmative action is almost universal. You can see that in the friend of the court briefs in this case and all the prior cases. Those briefs certainly had an effect uh, in the Bollinger cases that, uh, that uh, Justice O'Connor cited years ago. And I think that our panelists also support the use of affirmative action in admissions decisions. We have a poll, uh, the Wall Street Journal has a poll, the Pew Ch Trusts have a poll that shows that the public is not in the same place. That the Pew Charitable Trusts or Pew Research Center poll showed that people of all ethnic groups, there are divisions uh, between them, but majorities of, of all ethnic groups don't support uh, affirmative action and we saw that California voters turned down the chance in 2020 uh, to repeal uh, uh, Prop 209. So my first question would be, what is the disconnect between what education leaders see and what the general public seems to see about this issue? Yeah, um, who, do you want me to go first? Sure, I'm, Professor I'm Johnson. <laughs> I'm happy to go first. Um, First of all, it's just, it's remarkable that you can get a university president to provide such an, uh, an overview that's so detailed on the constitutional law issues at, at stake. And um, I will get to your question, but um, I will say that it really hi highlights for us what's at stake in these, in these cases and 
Um, it's important to remember that um, there's a way of beginning the history, not just with Brown, but with the 14th Amendment itself. I think that's really at stake um, here, which is an understanding of that amendment that was drafted um, by abolitionists, shaped by abolitionists in Congress, um, but also uh, enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, who were making claims to constitutional meaning. In some ways, we are where we are in American society, I think in a lot of ways, both as a matter of thinking about the Supreme Court, how we think about the Constitution, and how people understand race in our society because of the mixed legacy of how we think about the 14th Amendment and Reconstruction. And I don't think you can separate any of this racial discourse from the fact that we've never really grappled with what it means to engage in racial remedy in this country. And because of that, um, it is um, easy, and there has a long been a, a long-standing effort um, to try to eradicate any notion um, that um, racial remedy of any sort should play a role in American society. And so it's a kind of colorblindness narrative that's become um, triumphant, where we think about questions of fairness. Um, through a lens of colorblindness without thinking about subordination, without thinking about harm, without thinking about responsibility, without thinking about repair, and all the things that we can engage in in a democratic society. If we want to both repair and for forward-looking, build a multiracial democracy. And so this does get to your question, because I think that as someone who worked um, on these cases and teaches about them, I really try to have a lot of grace um, towards the questions people ask about affirmative action. Um, what really strikes me is a sense in which people don't understand how the programs are set up. Um, there's a persistent idea, and there's lots we can say about this, and I um, want other people to weigh in on this, but one um, persistent idea is that at stake are something like quotas. And we can debate whether or not quotas are ever a good idea, by the way, if you think in international contexts, um, there are lots of countries that use them. Um, but um, you're talking about a holistic admission system. If you, even if you don't want to go through the whole briefs, I'll tell you the upshot is, guess what? It's really hard to get into institutions like Harvard and um, Columbia, and race and ethnicity plays a very small factor. At UNC, they say it's decisive in 1.2% of their admissions decisions. They're thinking about a whole array of things. And I, well, there's mu much more to say on it, but I'll say another thing is um, about uh, socioeconomic and class, which plays a role in admissions. At, at UNC, 20% of the students are first generation, and I think more should be. Um, I think colleges should be more transformative, but I don't know if people really understand that. And against that, you have a very sort of easy narrative of colorblindness that fits really into um, our failure to really grapple with the meaning of race in this country. So, uh, I also uh, want to um, applaud uh, Lee Bollinger's role in his speech uh, that he's been engaged in for so long now uh, with respect to uh, what has come to be known as uh, affirmative action and diversity. One of the things I said this morning uh, when I saw President Bollinger in the uh, in the uh, the green room, was um, uh, I've been struck by the fact that in uh, the last couple of years, as these cases have worked their way to the Supreme Court, all of a sudden the discourse has returned uh, to an affirmative action discourse. Affirmative action was all but killed by the Supreme Court in the Bakke decision. I don't have the time to go uh, into uh, how that happened and what it signified in the depth that I would like, uh, but what survived uh, Bakke was the diversity rationale. And for those of you who are, particularly those of you who are undergraduate students, not and not law students and not lawyers. Let me give you an analogy. Uh, what Lewis Powell did in Bakke uh, is comparable to what Hollywood did 
uh, for ages when it purported to tell stories about black people. Uh, it did not tell those stories through the eyes of black people. It told those stories through the eyes of white people. That's what the Supreme Court, to the extent there was an opinion, it's what Powell's opinion did in Bakke. Uh, the rationale that survived was not a 14th Amendment-based rationale that was rooted in the interest of African Americans. Uh, or other people of color. It was a First Amendment-based rationale, which, by the way, I support as a second-best rationale, but it belonged to the universities, uh, that interest. And the voices of African Americans uh, in the litigation that continued because the attack on uh, race-conscious admissions never ceased. Uh, their voices were marginalized or eliminated in the Supreme Court up until these two cases. Finally, those voices were heard again, albeit still in a marginalized way. Uh, I hope I'm making sense uh, when I say what Justice Powell did. He was a conservative school board lawyer from Richmond, Virginia. That's the perspective he brought to this, and similarly, with all due respect, because I was very uh, much relieved when Justice O'Connor wrote the majority opinion in Gruda. But Justice O'Connor talked about 25 years. What in our experience as a country leads us to think that the problem of race was going to disappear in higher education and elsewhere in 25 years, in 2003. Uh, think about this for a minute, if you will. All the controversy we're in, the 1619 Project. That's an important date, though, even though some people don't want to grapple with that. African Americans, uh, 1619, and following 16, 1619 came 235 years of legally uh, supported or required subordination of people of African descent in the form of slavery in the colonial era and then into the United States. And then after that, in the form of uh, Jim Crow segregation, uh, black codes, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, 335 uh, uh, years of legally sanctioned subordination of African Americans in one form or another. The point I'm making, and I'm talking about black folks unabashedly, I think that President Bollinger did that too. It's not that that's the only part of the discourse, but I hope you hear what I'm saying. Uh, 335 years. If you count the time uh, that African, people of African descent have been in what's now the United States from uh, their first days, right now as we sit here, 83% of the days, you go do the math and then come back at me if I have it wrong, of people of African descent in what's now the United States have been spent in legalized subordination, particularly of, but not only, but particularly of African Americans. That's the point that I'm, I want to make. We've only begun recently to address the inequality that's manifested in all the ways that President Bollinger referred to, that we could talk about it. We've only been about this business for a relatively short period of time. It's absurd to think that uh, we wouldn't see uh, the present day manifestations of racial inequality uh, which require remediation and repair. Uh, so much more to say about that, so little time to say it. I would, I would suggest also that
students take a look at the friend of the court briefs in the case that talk about the uh, history, give you the perspectives of the different sides, and, and go into much more more detail. Uh, Professor Wynn, uh, yeah, go ahead. And, and I'll be quick here about about the uh, the specific question. Th and thank you so much for for having me here today um, with such distinguished uh, distinguished um, panelists. Um, just just to add, and, and, I, and I really agree with with everything that's been said. But just to quickly add, I think sort of um, from a so social science point of view, um, I've I've gotten to work a little bit on on survey questionnaires, asking question, sort of polling the American public on on their perceptions of of the use of race in college admissions. To, just to tack on to what was already said, I think a couple things to consider, right? Which is um, just the, the the complexity and patchwork of how affirmative action is being used or race conscious missions is used across this, the country is so different and varies so much that when someone is going to see that phrase in a survey question, they, they, they may interpret it as a wide range of how they might interpret it, right? And the second thing as someone who, you know, when you, when you design these things, I'm not saying that the, that the one you did is not validated or, or poorly designed, but it's all about the way we phrase these, these questions and, and those will elicit certain types of responses, right? And so um, I've seen surveys that, that have gone the other, other direction um, that show that that uh, that uh, large numbers or, or the, the majority of Asian Americans are in support of race conscious admissions. So um, I, I'm not, not to say that any survey is good or bad, but but that uh, we should take all these sort of data points that different sides are, are putting out there with a, with a grain of salt and take a look at sort of the survey instrument, right? So it's some, something to consider. Um, uh, President Bollinger mentioned, and this is the subject of, of your uh, brief in, in the case, uh, the role of Asian Americans in this litigation. The Harvard case was uh, brought in part uh, by uh, or on behalf of Asian American applicants who alleged that they were discriminated against because Harvard felt they were an overrepresented uh, minority. Uh, what have you found uh, about that question? Yeah, great. Thanks for asking that. So the, the, the sort of the Asian American experience in, in, in the United States is widely complex and one of the most diverse racial groups in, in here, right? Um, um, and so I think it's hard to sort of say uh, all Asian Americans are, are, are overrepresented or um, have one particular viewpoint in this, in this case. I think that's, that's, a broad, that's a broad assumption that we need to sort of remove ourselves from um, is that, that uh, 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 I represent, you know, I'm Vietnamese American, I'm Southeast Asian. That's one particular demographic in a very large, large and complex, diverse racial category. And so I think that's, that's important, right? So when a lot of the broader narrative is saying Asian Americans are, are being discriminated against or are, um, or are uh, 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 all, all, in, all against the use of race in college admissions, I think that is, that is, that is, that is an inaccurate statement. Um, and, and, and some of some of the literature out there uh, uh, um, um, shares that shares uh, shares those findings. Um, with respect to this particular case, right? I think it's a, it's it's a bit interesting. I think a lot of us argue that Asian Americans, a handful, were sort of picked and selected um, uh, in order to really uh, test this case through and, and push it through because other other plaintiffs have not been so successful. Um, so I think that's a that, that's an important consideration to make. Um, with respect to sort of what SFFA has said in the case about uh, them being particularly discriminated against, what we've seen actually, if you listen to the to the to the Supreme Court arguments, they didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about Asian Americans, right? And if you if you listen to that audio, so the so you know part of my skepticism says, was this case really about Asian Americans or not, right? Or, or or were they just simply a community, a small sector of this community was simply used as a wedge issue for to, to launch this. Uh, to launch these these lawsuits, um, we have some. There's some really interesting research out there. So one of the big claims, right, was that is that they're being discriminated against in one of the different categories for admissions, the so-called uh, uh, personal personal category, right, uh, which which some of which includes um, uh, 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 personal statements, um, letters of recommendation. Uh, that that is part of the analysis in the admissions process. Uh, and so there's the, the assumption there is that that's where the discrimination is happening. But if you sort of look at the, if you read our brief and look at the, the, the broader literature out there, there's a lot of other explanations that, that can be, um, that, can be that, that, we can, that we can point to that might lead to a, a, a lower score in that category rather than saying blanketly without really any broad evidence that uh, that, is, that is simply just discrimination against, against Asian Americans. Um. 
Let's assume that the court does uh, strike down the admission systems that are before it now. What are the options that you think uh, higher education has to try to maintain uh, 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 diversity uh, in, in the admitted classes? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take a first stab at that. Um, I think it's um, important just to take stock of where we are that the, we could entertain the idea that the Supreme Court is gonna strike down um, the Grutter opinion, or you know, maybe reverse the Grutter opinion, strike down the specific programs, because it really would require um, striking down um, the Grutter decision from 2003. And I think that in a post dobbs world, um, we can kind of cavalierly say, oh, the Supreme Court's going to strike that down, but the standards must be quite um, high. Um, <laughs> the decision has to be egregiously wrong from the start. There has to be an absence of reliance um, interest. And, um, and we've seen um, from the way in which the court dealt with reliance of women and people who could get pregnant in, in Dobbs that um, maybe it's willing to discount uh, reliance. But that in itself is a really big step um, to do when you have programs um, like the ones at issue here that um, are consistent uh, with what the court said was constitutional in Grutter. Um, so it really depends on how the opinion is written. I think one of the things to realize is that this is not just gonna affect um, higher education. The Supreme Court draws on um, and lower courts draw on um, the view of affirmative action, the constitutional conception of affirmative action, even in cases involving employment um, and housing. Um, and so your ability to construct remedies and design programs, even in environmental justice, um, they're, you know, in um, uh, the EPA anticipating what this suit is going to do has started to think about how it structures remedy for something that empirical evidence tells us is race-based, not even class-based, um, but is about race and racial isolation. Um, so it'll have a, a real impact on how we can design um, remedies um, in that program, in, in those contexts. Um, I think it's really important, and I think it was, it's important no matter what the court decides, for institutions to think more creatively and more transformatively about this thing that we call affirmative action. Um, so this can be about how we structure admissions, the thinking about an institution like Columbia and the partnerships it creates with community college, colleges, with historically black institutions or uh, majority, what is considered majority of people of color institutions. Uh, so I think it's really important, um, K through 12, um, the partnerships and the development of those kinds of systems that we think more transformatively beyond um, admissions programs. I think that's gonna be a part of how we think about remedies in this context. A lot of people jump to sort of the idea that we do class-based remedies. Actually, most of my work, I worked on the, what we call the Michigan Affirmative Action cases when I was an attorney at the Legal Defense Fund with Ted Shaw, but I actually started at LDF, you may remember, <laughs> to work on economic justice issues around um, economic justice. So I, one of the things I really don't like is the pitting of race and class um, against each other. I think that we should, if we're talking about class in this country, we shouldn't just use it as a slogan. Um, Class-based remedies are far beyond admissions. It would require a transformation of how we think about public education, as Professor, um, as, uh, President Bollinger referred to. Um, some of the biggest uh, mobility instruments have been universal programs, but they've done like social security, um, veterans benefits, um, New Deal housing programs, those are class-based interventions that weren't very good um, about dealing with race and in fact created racial wealth gaps, um, created spatial inequality that exists until today. So if we're going to talk about class, we have to think about the intersection between race and class and designing remedies, and we have to do things that are more transformative of all groups in terms of class and investments in public institutions. I am skeptical um, that that's what this is going to usher in, um, unless we all um, are part of a kind of democratic project to make that happen. That's certainly not the remedy in this case. Um, and I just wanna conclude by saying something with regard to Asian Americans that is really interesting, is that um, I think one should take seriously the idea of bias in any system, of the use of stereotypes. I, th I think that's really important for all of us who care about designing inclusive institutions,
And yet you're really struck by the fact that none of the remedies really get to how do you deal with bias and stereotypes um, in institutions. None of the remedies that are laid out. There's a sort of mismatch. And so that speaks to the broader question of who is going to be in charge of designing what the world looks like. Um, I um, wouldn't want it to be the SSFA lawyers because they haven't really mapped out um, what it looks like to have truly inclusive institutions that create forms of mobility. Uh, I just want to follow up on something you said, Professor Johnson. The, the local newspaper here in New York had a profile of Rick Kallenberg, who uh, is, uh, has written a, a, a brief or is helping the, the, uh, the, the plaintiffs in the case, arguing that class-based uh, uh, preferences should be, uh, would, would overlap a lot with, with uh, racial considerations. And one of the points he made when I, I read that profile, he said that having race-based classifications uh, promotes uh, resentment among the majority and makes, you know, and we've seen a lot of, you know, racially inflected politics in this country recently. Uh, is, is, there any, is there any truth to that? And Justice uh, Thomas has made that point as well. What, what, is, there any, is there any risk of that? Is there any truth to that? Yeah, can I, I say something <laughs> on that? And I'll, I, I just want to say that I, I'm, I'm friends with Professor Kallenberg, worked with him on so many programs to create advantage. Um, and um, he has a con conception of middle class schools that have low poverty rates. Um, he's also worked on trying to create inclusive um, a more demographically representative, maybe you wouldn't mention race, um, in um, selective high schools in New York and in Chicago. Um, I disagree with the idea that you should do a class analysis without race, and a lot of it is based on data that he himself has generated about what are middle class um, schools. They tend to be schools that have white children, right, right now. Um, that if you don't do a race and class analysis, you really submerge um, the effect. I know that um, Professor Shaw wants to talk about uh, about uh, racial resentment um, and what generates racial resentment. But I, I did want to, I just think it's really important, look at the Century Foundation reports on housing segregation um, to understand how race and class interact in this society. Oh, you know me so well. <laughs> um, uh, Rick Kallenberg is um, uh, someone whom I consider a friend, although we disagree on quite a bit. And I was thinking about before you asked your question, uh, I did see that this uh, article appeared uh, this morning. I didn't get a chance to read it yet, but I suspect that I have an idea about where it goes. Um, the reality uh, that is pretty clear with respect to the class point, the, the race class point, is if you have race blind, class conscious policies uh, with respect to admissions, uh, you may get uh, some degree of broader representation in selective institutions of students who do not come from economically privileged backgrounds. But what you're going to get uh, overwhelmingly is more white students who meet that definition. Uh, you will not get many black students. Uh, under those circumstances. They, and that's because the overwhelming majority of poor people in this country are still white, even though black people are disproportionately poor. Uh, so you can have race-blind class-conscious policies, um, uh, but you're not going to get much of a change when it comes to uh, admitting uh, students of color. That's one thing. Secondly, of course I want to say something about the issue of resentment and racial resentment. Uh, the reality is, is that this country and even its predecessor colonial era, uh, there has been uh, a huge uh, degree of racial resentment, uh, antipathy toward black people, uh, and there continues to be. Uh, and the rumors of racial inferiority uh, are very much alive today. Uh, it, it drives a lot of the uh, antipathy, or at least it gives uh, the, uh, that antipathy a rationale uh, 
So that's the reality. I'm not struck by uh, that antipathy. Uh, that's been our, uh, our part of our original sin in this country. The other original sin, I'm not talking about uh, what was done to indigenous people, but the original sin with respect to race. Um, so I, 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 um, I, I'm not surprised by that. And that's something that we still have to wrestle with. I, I will say that I think it is important to design programs in a way that breeds um, acceptance and um, a sense of um, investment in continuing them and all sorts of social programs I think we should design in that way. But um, I think the challenge is that uh, Professor Shaw is identifying is um, how do you do that without actually grappling with race? Um, you sometimes and often, and this is our history, is that we submerge um, race in the analysis in a way that doesn't build out benefits um, for for African Americans um, specifically. Um, and so I think that is that's sort of the project that we should put ourselves to. Sorry, Professor Wynn, I know you want to get in. No, 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 um, thank you for that. Um, no, I'll just quickly say that at end of the day, right, uh, uh, class is not a good proxy variable for, for race. Um, just we can look at our, our alma mater, UC Berkeley, and see the, uh, this, the horrible effect um, of, of, of their admissions um, over time since Prop 209. And the struggle that they've had, the UC system has had, in order to figure out how to to, to increase its di racial diversity without relying on, on race conscious admissions. And, and they would say, they would probably say um, that they're having a hard time and, and they're trying everything that they can, right? So, um, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's a, it's a high, very difficult task because a very, uh, it, a class is just not a, social economic status is just not a good proxy variable for race. And race is the only variable that we can use to, to, for, for it. Now, in, in a couple of moments, we're going to go to the, the, the actually good questions here, where the, the, the students, but I have one more to ask, and I'm going to single out Professor Shaw only because of his institutional affiliation with UNC, one of the uh, defendants in, in the current cases. So I know you're not, to, uh, you're not responsible for whatever the administration uh, does there. But in the Fisher right. cases, <laughs> in, the, in the Fisher cases, one thing that struck me, these are the predecessor cases on this issue where the Supreme Court upheld uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the, the Grutter decision. There was a, a friend of the court brief from UNC that I thought was very interesting, and it, what it said was, uh, we, like Texas uh, after Hopwood, we could go to a top 10 plan. Thanks, <laughs> luckily we have this legacy of entrenched residential segregation in our state, and therefore, if we were to simply take the best uh, graduates of each of the high schools in North Carolina, uh, we would uh, actually have a more diverse class than if we did what we do now. In other words, there would be more black students at UNC Chapel Hill if we had a top 10 plan throughout this state. But they would be worse prepared, they would be less qualified than the black students we uh, take from you know, private schools or whatever, uh, you know, the better prepared black students, and that would cause our ranking to go down among other universities. So the interest of UNC is to uh, preserve its status in higher education, and that would be damaged if we used a top 10 plan, even though it would bring a, maybe a marginal number, but somewhat more uh, black students into the, the, the school. What's, what, what did, I, I, was, I thought it was a remarkable uh, uh, brief uh, to, to read. What, what, what do you make of that point? So first, uh, let me point out that that brief uh, would not be submitted under the current regime at the University of North Carolina because the Board of Governors um, uh, has prohibited uh, that kind of voice uh, speaking within the university right now. I could explain more. Uh, but shame on the Board of Governors of the institution for which I work right now. Um, uh, I remember when the 10% plan was adopted, uh, and I remember being um, in touch with and working with people in the state legislature in Texas at that time, uh, and there was a rush to try to do something to mitigate the impact of uh, the Hopwood decision. That's the context, as you heard, in which 
the 10% plan came about. But what was clear from the very beginning to those of us who were engaged in these issues was that the 10% plan in many ways was a dishonest discourse uh, because uh, what it did, as I think President Bollinger mentioned, uh, was uh, it purported to select the top 10% of high schools all across the state of Texas for admissions to the University of Texas at Austin, and I think also uh, one of the other flagship institutions. Uh, many of those communities, by the way, did never, and I'm talking about even white communities, white high schools, never sent anybody to the University of Texas at Austin before or hardly sent anybody. And so there's another discourse that needs to take place about how educational opportunity is, is provided quite aside from race. But certainly what they relied upon was the fact that uh, high schools and communities throughout Texas uh, were segregated racially. So you take the top 10% of all of these high schools, you're gonna get some black students. Uh, what that brief referred to and what you just alluded to uh, was the fact that, uh, with all due respect, the, the, most, the best prepared African-American uh, students or Mexican-American students, for example, uh, in uh, some of those high schools, uh, didn't have the best preparation uh, for the University of Texas, if you're gonna use the standards that are used now, that's another conversation. But um, uh, some of the best students, uh, black and Mexican American and other students, might be in majority white student, uh, in uh, high schools rather. Uh, but they nonetheless um, prepared uh, and are better prepared for, uh, you know, uh, excelling uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so uh, that was what that brief was alluding to, as well as a whole raft of other issues. One thing quickly related. Uh, there was a mention here of uh, de facto um, uh, uh, segregation. Uh, my view is, by the way, that that's another piece of dishonest discourse coming out of Supreme Court jurisprudence. If you haven't read Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, I encourage you to read it. Segregation in this country, residential and otherwise, is not accidental, it's not serendipitous, it's the consequence of years and years and decades and decades of actions on the state level and um, state federal uh, and local level that have conspired uh, to create the patterns that we see today. Um, it, it was not unintentional for the most part. So I think that the problem is, is that the 10% plan discourse was intellectually dishonest, although well-intentioned, I think, just as, uh, or maybe uh, I think more uh, good intentions, but our jurisprudence has been intellectually dishonest when it comes to race in so many ways. Uh, and that's the legacy that we're dealing with. We'd like to uh, invite some uh, or any of you to come on up and, uh, and ask your own questions of our, uh, of our panelists today. Hello, uh, thank you for this panel. Mike, I'm currently a law student at Columbia, and my question revolves around what should the role of students be in advocating for affirmative action, and what role should they have in fighting against the possible lack of diversity that might result from the fall of affirmative action, specifically with conversations around how can students be part of maybe with the admissions process, talking about getting rid of structural barriers that prevent students of color from entering institutions such as the LSAT and the high cost of going into institutions such as these. What can students do? 
So Sounds to me like you're thinking about yeah. it. Right <laughs> you can answer your own yeah. question. Yeah, uh, I, I think they should follow Jack Ruiz from Columbia Law School um, in, uh, in articulating what that is. One of the things that really um, struck me in this latest round of litigation were how many student voices there were, much more so than in past array um, of litigation. The way I would have to told the story slightly differently from um, Professor Bollinger, um, uh, President Bollinger, soon to be Professor Bollinger, um, is that um, social movements and students uh, played a big role in the creation of these uh, programs in the first instance. A lot of pressure they put on public institutions. Um, and so I think one is that from a, le um, a legal perspective, um, anyone could write an amicus brief in these cases. Um, we um, worked with um, students, high school students, in some of the K through 12 um, cases. You may know this, but SSFA and the lawyers behind it are challenging even race neutral programs, programs that um, rely on geography, that rely on class. Those are being challenged at the, um, at the K through 12 level. And so we've put together student voices, um, worked with them to have their voices present in that. And you'll see that in all of this, um, in the Harvard case, for instance, um, Asian American student groups um, were active participants in the litigation talking about the benefits of affirmative action. But then in the aftermath, yes, um, there's something that everyone can do. And, and I think it's really important that people who are critical or skeptical about affirmative action tell us what you're doing in terms of building pathways and pipelines, what, who you're mentoring, who you're tutoring, what partnerships you're developing with institutions that don't look like elite institutions and with individuals. I think we can all play a role on that level too. I want to mention quickly, uh, students have been engaged in, for, you know, for a long time, maybe forever in these issues. When I was a student here, Baki was in the Supreme Court of the United States. I was on the national board of BALSA. BALSA was very much involved in uh, advocating against um, uh, the challenge that was represented in the Baki case. And it gives me an opportunity. I want to lift up the name of somebody who was the national head of BALSA at that time, Charles Ogletree. Um, who is a dear friend and colleague, and uh, he has been struggling, is struggling with uh, early onset of all, uh, Alzheimer's. I want us all to remember uh, who he was because, uh, and was because we've already lost him in many ways, even though he's physically still here. But he's a great advocate and is a model for what students did even back in that day. Uh, thanks for the panel. Um, so research done by Thomas Espenshade and Alexandria Radford in 2009 uh, showed that affirmative action at selective universities amounted to an effective 310 point increase in black SAT scores compared to white scores and an effective 450 point increase um, in black scores compared to Asian scores. Uh, given these statistics showing that affirmative action is not just breaking the tie, um, but radically boosting uh, certain applicants over others, um, why is it justice to con uh, why is it considered justice um, to judge Asians uh, significantly more harshly um, when they are not necessarily responsible for America's uh, past and racial wrongdoing? Um, given that college admissions are inherently zero sum, uh, can current affirmative action be described as unfairly trampling one group in order to benefit another? I mean, that's the essence of the critique, zero-sum game, only so many seats in Columbia College. What's the answer? Do you want to go first? I'll, I'll go second, yeah, go. I mean, I don't know where to begin <laughs> on the <laughs> statistics. Um, so um, I, I think it's really, it's an important question. I think um, one is it says a lot, even in how you frame the question um, around the importance of test scores. So the only way in which you really know, and this is why the record in these particular cases I think are important despite the fact that I don't, I wouldn't have welcomed necessarily a challenge, um, it's very important to understand the weight that, that institutions place on um, test scores um, relative to other forms of admission. So it's not enough to point to a test score gap. You have to think about the weight that that plays in a particular institution. Of course, it's already been pointed out that institutions practice affirmative action in different ways. They use and rely on standardized tests in different ways. And I don't know the report that you are talking about, but I do know the record in these cases. And that the, the weight that it's given 
Um, second, I think it's, um, there's a lot more to say about the data and the statistics, but another thing is that it suggests that we should be relying on test scores to the extent that we do, and that they're a marker of merit. I think that they are an important data point. The question is, how do they compare with other forms of measuring merit and success. Um, one thing I would say about the 10% programs that I think is important is that people who are at the top of their class and people who um, get good grades um, and they do as well as they can in their institutions, that's an important indicator of future, future success. Um, in fact, it's more powerful a driver um, by a lot of the data when you look at four-year um, college success rates and you look at professional um, involvement. Um, two more things, um, because I could obviously write a dissertation about this, is um, I think that uh, we have to think about what about that term zero sum. Just query it. I'm not, it's not an easy thing to answer. Is education zero sum? Should it be zero sum? Right? Um, so I, the thing that comes to me if we're giving you book recommendations is Heather McGee's The Sum of Us, which is essentially that this notion that access and opportunity or zero sum is the key narrative that drives us and defines us and is why we have these fights over racial spoils around education. Maybe another way to think about it is that the stakes of going to an institution like Columbia should not redound to a few. The Columbia should think about its mission broadly in terms of partnerships, in terms of sharing knowledge so that it shares its resources and that the primary driver of economic mobility are public institutions. Um, the UCLA that my father went to as an immigrant uh, coming to the United States, um, benefiting from affirmative action, certainly Kennedy administration programs that reached out to African students in a kind of global Cold War mission. Um, and, but you think about those as being the engines of driver. Maybe we have a vision of what it is to create economic prosperity um, and inclusion that is not um, so zero sum. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, that's going to require work. It's going to require imagination. It's going to require redesign. It's such a different way of thinking. Um, I, I did have to say one more little thing, which is about my classroom. And that's that if it matters only to you what grades your students get um, on, their, for, on this high stakes exam that I give to my students and we all give um, that is curved, um, you might have a certain understanding of education. If we have an understanding that all my students contribute to the classroom in terms of the perspectives that they bring, the ideas, okay, to a set of a knowledge that is um, not just, did you read the case well, but what are the insights that you're bringing to this case and what kind of knowledge and, pr and production are you gonna have in this world after this? Um, there's a democratic purpose to education. It's not meant to be touchy-feely, even measured um, by um, you know, what we're contributing to the larger universe of, of knowledge in a more conventional sense. I need all my students. I learned something about rest racially restrictive covenants from some of my students recently. I didn't know they operated in California against Asian Americans in the way they did. I've learned about neurodiversity from my students and they've learned about each other. That's what education ultimately is about. And I think institutions, elite institutions, should be particularly attentive to this. Did you have something, uh, Professor Nguyen? I do, thank, thank you for that, so that's beautifully said. Um, so a couple, a couple of things is, uh, um, with respect, I, if it's the, 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 the report of the book, you're, uh, I think you're referring to the, the Thomas Esplanade book. Um, so re remember, that, that analysis was done using data from the 1990s, right, early 90s. So, the higher education landscape and admissions process is dramatically different than it was back then when they were testing some of those assumptions. Um, second thing is, I th if you actually ask him, right, he's actually been on the record uh, essentially saying that um, this is what, it's an interesting finding and it's an interesting data point in their statistical model, um, but it's been sort of widely misinterpreted and broadly skewed and used as a, as a, as a talking point by SFFA and others um, to, to sort of cite that, that example, right? And that it's actually much more complex and the fact that if you look at that statistical model, there's a lot of variants that they're not accounting for. They, you, know, you, read, you read the book, um, I think if it's the same book that we're referring to, they'll say in the sort of limitations section, right, that there's, uh, there's factors they're unable to account for in that model. And so, um, so just some, some, you know, again, social science research is we are always trying to advance it, but we, we, we don't take these findings um, uh, as, as sort of permanent, right, is that they are going to evolve over time because the landscape changes, society changes, 
as well as the fact that um, it's, it's, it's impossible to account for all sort of factors in, in, a, in a model. We, we estimate as be best as we can, and, uh, and at some point we have to, have to redo those analyses with new data, better data, uh, more accurate data, more current data. Um, to the second point uh, with that, and I think uh, was, was mentioned, is, is, do, is, is, is SAT sort of the only metric we want to use for college admissions? Is that, is that, is, should that be just the only thing and, 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 and that should determine who gets into a school like, like Columbia and, and who doesn't? Um, I, 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 I would fear that that would make for uh, a, a, a less exciting classroom interaction. And, uh, and I think that's why um, schools like uh, that, that are being sued today are, are, are use a holistic admissions process that certainly accounts for that as one factor among many others uh, in order to uh, uh, build a diverse classroom where we can have those types of interactions in class uh, rather than just um, uh, just just uh, just perfect SAT scores and if that were the case uh, th there's a lot of people getting those scores how would how would then uh, uh, a school like Columbia then decide um, if, if that's the only variable we're using in in, in admissions but th thank you for that question. All right, next. Jess, Jess, we have two mics. Two mics, oh my. <laughs> See, I, I did bad at math. Two mics, let's have on this side now. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I'm a student in the film school. I'm a former member of the state legislature, a progressive Democrat. Um, one of the things I really focused on while in office was disparity and inequality you know, from, from wealth to opportunity to health care to education. And one of the um, conclusions I came to was that the way to address almost all of those was improving education. Um, but there's one sense that what we're doing here in higher education is maybe a little late to the game and that we should really be focusing our resources much earlier, elementary school, pre-K and things because we know from looking at public school systems that there is such a diversity of ability, schools in affluent neighborhoods getting A's and in the more diverse neighborhoods getting F's. Uh, but in the, the Pew poll you referred to, uh, Mr. Braven, uh, it had 74% of Americans against, and you know, Pew is a reputable organization. It was a relatively uh, non-biased question. It simply asked, should race and ethnicity be a consideration in admission? And that 74%, you know, the majority carried across racial divisions, across um, parties. So my question is, and we saw it with 209, you know, the American people don't seem to be for this. So is there a sense, I mean, I find it a little problematic that this discussion today, everybody's on the same side. So to what extent is it actually a dialogue versus some sense of an agenda, but I wonder if you could answer if there's a disconnect or if it's problematic, uh, our position versus what uh, the majority of Americans feel, and in this day and age it's pretty hard to find anything that Americans agree on almost 75 percent of the time. So my sense of this is that, uh, uh, and I'm I could be wrong about this. I think that when people hear that question as framed, um, it appeals to their aspirational sense of what uh, our country should be and how it should operate and how admission should operate. And so even if you ask, I think, uh, the majority of African Americans, you might get a majority saying that, yeah, we, we, um, you know, it'd be better, or we shouldn't take this stuff into account. If you frame the question uh, a little bit more, that gives some of the um, the background that informs uh, the need to uh, either address uh, the inequalities that we've talked about today, uh, if we're going to get opportunity across the board, you might get another answer. If you ask people whether you believe that we should take um, uh, steps to make sure that opportunity uh, is open to those from groups who historically have been discriminated against, you may get another question. Um, so I'm not surprised about the answer, but I also say that some of it, I think, uh, but maybe I'm being too jaundiced, uh, reflects an antipathy that 
continues. Uh, and the rumors of inferiority with respect to black folks. And um, the fact that we're not fully informed about some things. I was thinking as we sat here about the fact that, you know, the strongest correlation uh, that SAT scores has with any other factor is with wealth of parents slash parents um, who had college uh, or higher opportunities. Um, so are we content to, uh, to leave the inequalities that follow from uh, SAT scores uh, being uh, so heavily weighted in place? Do we really believe that that's merit? Or that's, I'm not saying they don't have any role to play, but do we believe that's the be all and end all of merit? Do we really believe that we should be doing nothing to continue to try to address the inequality that exists in this country um, that uh, we've talked about and the causes that we've talked about? And I would say that also, I, I mean, I think it's important that people learn in different spaces. Um, and that we all take seriously, um, I guess I, I would say that I, I think there's more persistent opposition, um, even no matter how you frame the question. And I think the understanding of that is not going to happen through polls. Um, really, it's gonna happen through conversations. Um, and this is part of an opening to give um, people uh, resources and perspectives, but I don't think it's the only place people should have hard conversations about uh, questions of affirmative action. Um, just the fact that there's been endless litigation uh, means that there are um, uh, different views on it. Now, some of it is very driven ideologically. It's not all uh, driven by, you know, a kind of problem solving approach, but I think you can create um, spaces, um, I'd always love to see slow conversations and not just debates, um, ones in which you take information from different sources and then you have deeper, richer conversations and all universities should create those, those spaces um, within their schools to really have, have that. We try to create it in the classroom, um, maybe not always successful, but also outside of the classroom. I, I think just a quick follow-up is that the idea that probably drives a lot of people is a belief in meritocracy. And so the question is why in these cases should we sort of overturn meritocracy on some level? Because there's never been a meritocracy, a pure meritocracy in this country, right. and there isn't today, uh, with all due respect. I, I apologize for getting no. so uh, I, I agree, perhaps you, I heated. I agree with you, but I'm just talking but, about the yeah. common yeah. yeah, I mean, it, you know, we don't have a pure meritocracy and we still have a legacy that we're struggling with. As I said earlier, that we only recently began to try to address. We still have more work to do in this country before we can talk about meritocracy. Uh, you familiar with the book, When Affirmative Action Was White? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah. Thank you. By okay. Iris Katz Nelson of Columbia University. <laughs> yeah, so um, I was talking to a friend, a family friend recently. He's, he's pretty young, he's about nine. I was talking to him and uh, essentially he shared the sentiment that, you know, a lot of younger kids these days don't want to go to college, right? Because mm -hmm. if we look at 1940s, back in the days when you ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? We'll say like engineer, astronauts, like these require higher education, right? But these days, the number one answer is YouTuber. And YouTuber on, on surface, you know, you don't really need a college education. <clears throat> so I think, you know, the role of college and the purpose of college, especially undergrad, you know, 30 years ago compared to now is very, very different. Uh, so I would like to ask the panel, if you were to give a current definition or current purpose of college, what would that be? And how would affirmative action be good or bad for that, uh, mm. for that purpose? You can go first, Professor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a, such a good question. I think that's something that I, I grapple with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and in, in, in my own work, right? Um, uh, there's so many good answers and uh, that, uh, responses I can give you. I think for me, at least, right, just my own personal perspective, which is, 
Um, I, I, I reflect on my own experiences as a college undergraduate um, at, at, at UC Berkeley and, and, and recognizing that I came in with um, a certain view and a certain perspective, so much based on my own family's experiences. And then I went to a place that I got to meet some, some different people um, uh, from different backgrounds, uh, really steeped in ways where um, uh, people thought differently and, and lived differently and grew up differently. And it was in the classroom, it was in the dorm, it was over in the dining hall, it was playing sports, um, that my world opened up and I had a whole new perspective on um, how beautiful and how complex and how sad our American history is. Um, and uh, uh, th that sort of led me to where I am sitting today, right? But, but I think, um, I think, I think that's, that's my number one driver, number one goal. That's something that I try to instill when I teach in my own classrooms is, is that we can grapple with the, the t our, our beautiful history and our terrible history, learn from each other and figure out ways to move our society into in, 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 in more equitable, uh, equitable ways. And um, we, I think the goal is we, if we want the best for each other, that, that, that to me is the, is, is the way I think about it. So um, less of a, um, academic answer for you, but more of a personal one. So, yeah, so the tag on question would be, why would you think affirmative action is good or bad for that? So going back to the... I think to, a, uh, to, so, to sort of have those, ex to have those experiences, right, is, is, and that's become a bit of the narrative of, 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 the, of, the, of court decisions is to build a, a, a diverse, um, a diverse uh, classroom, a diverse college campus. But uh, equally as well as, as to, is, is to address um, uh, uh, historical uh, structural racism as well as ongoing racism today, right? Those, those to me are the, are the, are the, are the big drivers. So part of the function of affirmative action is to, is us to counteract the, the, the bias that's there in how you're making admissions decisions and also um, um, ensure that you're not replicating um, forms and patterns of inequality. And I think that's really true even with a diversity uh, rationale mm. um, to recognize, uh, you know, that what's the alternative that you just reward people who have already been rewarded, I, I think is, is a risk. Um, um, but I, I just, I think that what you're asking ultimately goes um, even further beyond affirmative action. To, it's really a time where we have to think about the purposes of higher education, particularly because it's costly. Um, and I still latch on to those democratic purposes. I have lately been thinking that people should all have double majors or they should have a core curriculum like Columbia. I know this is uh, maybe not a popular idea, but because of that democratic function. But I think we all have to justify why people have to go to school for four years and the expense of it and, and how that's needed. I don't think it should just be about skills, but then we should think about the cost. Um, I know that doesn't completely answer your question, but to me that's the more interesting and important question um, that goes even beyond affirmative action. We're gonna go to the, our last two questions here. All right, um, when you all spoke about the, like the Texas 10% plan and like the limits of maybe implementing that in North Carolina, a big part of that was talking about the preparedness of students and like how we have geographic segregation and that also limits class as a proxy. But we, at the same time, we're expecting universities to fix this, and I think that puts a lot of pressure on admissions. What are your thoughts on a bottoms-up approach where we actually adequately resource these high schools? And would that kind of approach kind of limit the need for affirmative action or make it less contentious in society because many more students of diverse backgrounds could be better prepared? I'll just jump in really quick. I don't think it's uh, an, an or. I think it's an and. I think we should be doing both, right? I think that's the simple answer is we should be investing in, 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 in K-12 education, doing a much better job there, as well as um, uh, continuing practices that, that enhance uh, racial equity and racial diversity on college campuses. Uh, I, I don't like having to choose when, you can, when, you, we, when we can do both, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the setup, uh, that has that is there often in the discourse is that we have to choose, and I think it's it's a sense of affirmative action is a remedy for all sorts of social inequities. I mean, it doesn't have that uh, kind of impact or possibility. Um, uh, we even said just demographically, 1.2 percent, <laughs> you know, race um, mattering in these decisions. That's very small um, in the context of holistic admissions. But just to add to that, I think universities can play a role in strengthening K through 12. Um, education, um, and that is a way of sort of linking the sort of beyond admissions point. 
I think you had a quick follow up, but uh, we I was have say, one like, more minute. Like part of the thought is that um, a handful of additional Ivy League graduates aren't going to reshape society the way that fixing education generally across the country and allowing many, many more people to have access to a university at all. Yeah. I feel like that would have a much larger impact. Yeah. Let's get in our last question because we're running into a time, uh, yeah. a time uh, uh, barrier here. Um, thank you, panelists, uh, for um, this afternoon. Um, my question is, in the event that affirmative action is um, not um, going to be upheld, um, what impact or implications would that have on institutions that are not seen as elite institutions, such as um, maybe some of the historically black colleges and universities, and we know that those institutions are already dealing with issues such as um, chronic underfunding? Well, uh, a number of people, a lot of people are thinking about the question, with, especially with respect to the HBCUs, the um, maybe easy, but I'm not sure it's correct analysis would be that the HBCUs will end up being the beneficiaries of uh, of the end of uh, affirmative action slash diversity efforts at uh, predominantly white institutions. Although there's an amicus brief that was filed by HBCUs in uh, these cases that uh, will give you a better perspective on what the HBCUs interests are and why they support continued diversity efforts and uh, affirmative action. Um, and so I refer you uh, to them. Uh, uh, what the impact is gonna be broadly in higher education and in institutions that are uh, non-selective perhaps feeds back to the question that we just touched lightly upon a moment ago, uh, the question of who goes to college and why, who doesn't go. Uh, you know, how other people prepare, how some people prepare for life and others uh, prepare for life. That's a long um, uh, discussion that uh, I'm probably not best prepared to talk about right now in this limited time we have. Uh, all I can do is point to the significance of the question that you raise. Well, we have to end, uh, unfortunately, but maybe that could be a topic for the next uh, semester's program. Uh, administrators, write that one down. Uh, our questions, I, I hope they were good and stimulating in our system. The questions that matter are those that the Supreme Court justices asked at the arguments. I'd encourage you all to listen to the audio or uh, of that argument uh, in the two cases and get a sense of what is on the court's mind. It might prepare you for what the court ultimately will decide. Uh, thank you to uh, our great panel, our, uh, to President Bollinger, to Mr. Mitchell, everybody for putting this together.